right, we're live. We're live. I'm going on Facebook now. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Earth Week. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are about to start our virtual Sustainachella. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And oh, here, the music is going a little bit crazy. And please uh, be patient with us. We are still learning about the whole virtual sustain the whole virtual platform here to to transfer Sustainable Chala virtually. So anyways, thank you again for joining. So I'm very excited today. We're going to be talking about plants and trees. Um, and you know, I, I personally have been having a really hard time keeping some of my plants happy. So very intrigued to see what, you know, Dr. Harper is going to be bringing us today, her, Omar, and all our panelists. And uh, before we wait a couple of minutes to get everyone to join us, um, I wanted to start warming up um, our chat. So just wondering, um, and if you're new to, to Zoom, your chat is right on the bottom in the middle of your screen, and then you can start chatting with us. Uh, make sure you select everyone so everyone is getting um, your comments in. Um, and if you are new to Sustainachella, to our virtual Sustainachella, one of our main goals um, is to try to take you away a little bit from this COVID world for a moment and, you know, try to get you in a happy place um, for, for a moment. And, and know that we are here to support you and if there is anything that, you know, we can do, please let us know. Um, we definitely want to try to do anything we can do in order to support others' mental health. Uh, we are going to be sending a survey right after this Sustainachella. So if you have any comments, anything you would like to learn about it, um, any new workshops that we should be bringing in, please let us know. All right, so enough of, of talking. Let's start warming up the chat. So question, how many of you guys have kill a plan before? And you can also raise your hand. There is the raise, it, raise hand thing so you guys can can actually let me know about it. And let me see, I'm looking at the chat right now. All right, guilty. <laughs> I have a green thumb, black thumb here. Oh, it's so hard, right guys? It is, it's kind of crazy. I had a plan to commit suicide. No, oh, it happens to all of us, me too. Oh gosh, yeah, all okay. right, okay, I'm not alone. I'm glad, glad to hear that I'm not alone in this um, difficult plant world that we are living in. All right, so for the guys that just joined, so all on Zoom guys, so housekeeping here, um, everyone were muted and the videos are disabled. This is to avoid uh, Zoom booming. And you can type uh, questions in the Q&A. &A. We have a Q&A box. You can throw your comments in the chat. It's going to be, you know, super live. You're going to be keep checking it and answering to you. Make sure you check on everyone, all panelists, attendees, so you're talking to everyone. And, oh yeah, and I, and I mentioned that it was Earth Week. It's actually Earth Month. So we have a lot of workshops coming in April and here is the list. You guys can check it out in mbrisingabove.com slash sustainachella. Uh, it's not only April, actually, we are also extending it to May. So again, if you guys have any cool ideas, let us know um, and we'll bring it to you. So today I'm very excited, not only because we are going to talk about plans, but also because our, we, we, don't, we not only have um, the Miami Beach community, but we also have other communities joining us today. So super excited. So guys, um, you know, help me here to, uh, and join me here to welcome the other communities that we have here today. So I'll start with West Palm Beach community and our rock star sustainability hero, Penny Bradford. So yay. <laughs> yay, thank oh, you. All right, awesome. Uh, we are happy to be here. All right, and we also have from across the planet, we have Maui County. <laughs> And Makalea, thank you, our rock star sustainability <laughs> from Maui. 
Aloha. Thanks for letting us um, jump in on this. You guys are amazing. We're glad to be here. Awesome. And from Nashville, our sustainability hero, Jennifer. Say hi to Nashville. Howdy, y'all. Howdy from Nashville. So glad to be here. Awesome. And, and also, our sustainability rock star, Carrie from Sunrise. Sunrise is in the house, too. Woo! Hey, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much. So very excited to have all the communities joining us. So Miami Beach, remember, welcome all your friends from all the different communities that are joining us here today. Um, and we are about to start, so I just wanted to give a quick intro here from our amazing urban forestry team. We'll have here Harper Martinez and Omar Leon. Um, they are amazing, and I'll pass the presentation to Harper so she can take it over. Harper, I'm stopping my presentation right now so you can share your screen. Perfect. So... So, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> my name is Harper Martinez. I am the forestry field specialist within the Urban Forestry Division here at the City of Miami Beach. And we also have on the line our urban forester, Omar Leon. See if he wants to say a couple of words. Hello, everybody. And uh, Harper, uh, Harper, thank you very much. Happy Arbor Day to all. Uh, my name is Omar Leon. I'm the city's urban forester. Um, as part of the urban forestry division within the city of Miami Beach, you know, we are tasked with overseeing regulatory oversight of the city's uh, tree ordinance, but we also have a lot of exciting programs that we manage as well, including the geobond reforestation uh, projects that have taken place within the city, where we're planting over 5,000 trees citywide over the upcoming years. Um, in addition to that, uh, we also are managing the commemorative tree program which allows uh, both residents and visitors to dedicate a, a tree within the city to a special someone or in, in uh, honor of a, of, a, of a special day. And also uh, we manage the city's uh, tree heritage, uh, heritage tree program. The heritage tree program allows residents to actually uh, nominate trees within their private properties as heritage trees. Uh, to celebrate those uh, special benefit that these trees give to all of our neighborhoods. Um, I want to say thank you to all the partners that are joining us here today, all those uh, who have taken the time to join us as well. I, I am very uh, grateful and, and, and happy to see you guys here and participating. And I know that uh, Harper has worked very hard in this presentation, and I hope you guys enjoy uh, the presentation that she has in store for you guys today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Omar. So I'm going to go ahead and just tell everyone just a little bit about myself. Why should you listen to me? Uh, my name's Harper. I've been now in the green industries for about 10 years. I actually started off as a simple job working in a tree service, and I worked my way up, literally. I started trimming trees uh, and got eventually I've hold many different titles. I've been a naturalist, a horticulturist, a landscape manager, and now I am, I say, certified arborist and do consider myself an arborist, which means someone that takes care of trees kind of from their inception all through their growth, free production, and eventual removal, including pest controls and a whole lot of different things. My specialty really has been Florida native trees, uh, but especially recently, I've really delved into a lot of in-home species. And actually, if you see behind me, I'm here at home. I've got a kind of a small collection of indoor plants along with a pretty cool plant light that I'll talk about at the end if anybody's got any more questions about that. Let me pull up the Q&A right here. Pull that in a second. So to move on. Actually, uh, Omar kind of uh, said a little bit, but does anybody know what day it is today? Yeah, <laughs> it's Arbor Day. It's Arbor Day, and as you are all are watching this presentation, feel free to use the hashtag, hashtag Arbor Day at home. Uh, the Arbor Day uh, Foundation has been trying to kind of adapt to our current situation. Uh, the city of Miami Beach is a tree city USA and tree cities of the world, but at Arbor Day and the Arbor Day Foundation was started back in 1872 when over a million trees were planted on that day. Uh, and traditionally, it is celebrated on that last Friday in April. Here we've got a couple of pictures of how we've celebrated Arbor Day in the past here at the city of Miami Beach. You can see our mayor, some of our residents and volunteers, and even some of our staff, as we are trying to increase our city's tree canopy as much of the other cities around here. 
And before we start getting into the nitty gritty details, the first thing is to really understand how to take care of a plant. You have to really understand what they need. And that's really, they have five basic requirements. You've got air, water, sun, nutrients, and soil. And today we're gonna to dive in depth into most of those requirements. And as you start to look at those five requirements, really those are there to really fuel the foundation of what plants do, which is photosynthesis, in which they take all of this amazing energy coming from the sun, they use carbon dioxide and water, and they create both carbohydrates and oxygen. And as that oxygen is released, is what we use for breathing and surviving. And those carbohydrates are then used in many different ways. They're used as cellulose to one, build up the trees to great heights. They're used for food, much like fruits, and even in their sap, like maple syrup that we find in trees. And as you start to work with humans and trees, there are a vast majority of benefits that you get the more trees that you have within cities. Uh, it can reduce urban heat island effects, it helps the environment, it helps design. And we could go on and on about all of the benefits trees have within communities, but today we're really gonna focus on how can you make your plants better within your home, whether it be inside or within a landscape of a yard. And so all of the benefits that plants provide really start all with decorative uh, benefits. You know, they'll make, help a space look better. They'll boost your mood at liveliness. And outside, you can help reduce your electricity bill by placing them correctly. You can grow fruits and veggies or even reduce some of that stormwater runoff by reducing how much rain is constantly hitting your house and hitting the drains uh, right away. And now I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it off. Hola, Coco from across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is Tamara from Maui Nui Botanical Gardens, and I just wanted to jump in and mention that, you know, if you are growing plants, think about whether you are about to plant an invasive species. Um, here on Maui, we work hard to keep our native species protected, and so um, one thing that's interesting between Hawaii and Florida is that Hawaii is actually has a native plant that became invasive in Florida called the beech nalpaca and it is actually supplanting Florida native coastal vegetation, including some rare beach plants. And then on the reverse, we've got the gumbo limbo tree, which is a Mexico and Central American native that's naturalizing on Kailua Kona on the big island right now, on Hawaii Island, and that can invade the forest even in shade. So not all plants are great for every space. You wanna get the right plant in, in the right place. And some of the things that make landscaping and house plants so easy to grow also can make them invasive, so check your local sources for to make sure that the plant you're planting is an invasive. Thank you so much. So now you've thought about, you know the benefits, you know you have to choose a plant that works for the area, but now what, what do you go next? You know, what do you all think are some of the requirements plants have beyond those five basic requirements? How do you decide where to go, how to take care of that? Well, the first step is actually going to be read the labels. As you start going, most of the time you buy it or purchase plants is going to be most likely at some sort of hardware store or some sort of commercial nursery. Most of those will have uh, a label that is put within those that is gonna tell you the water usage, the light, how you should space it, how you should prune it. And it can be a bit overwhelming as you start out. But as you start bringing it in, it's also going to have the name of the plant, which is very important. But Say you got the plant from a friend, say you got it in a nursery where you don't speak the language. That happens often in bilingual or trilingual communities, much like South Florida. Well, start doing some research. Find reliable sources. I know we all love to Google things, but often the first couple of results aren't the best. Often what I love to do is I love to put in the name of the plant and I'll put in like IFAS extension because that's our local government extension that does have a ton of articles, but even for many plants, you will find information from some of the other local extensions like Georgia, Penn State, uh, that will really help you got, get science-based information. And so now you know you got the plant, you know what it is, you want to start off with a healthy plant before you bring it home. That's how you can start avoiding a lot of these problems. You want to look for any sort of dead or decayed leaves, any sort of stem damage and what's happening. You want to keep an eye out on any type of pest, even if you don't know what it is. If you see any little creepy crawlies around there, 
And especially you want to look at roots growing out of pots because that can often, especially for trees, signal that that pot has been there or that tree has been in that pot for a very long time and could have deficiencies in the future. Or weeds, if you've got a tiny little plant with a ton of stuff sticking out of there, that might not be the ideal thing for you to bring home. And so now you know what your plant is, you know what its name is, you know what it's supposed to have. So now we start looking at this kind of circle of requirements where people often go wrong is light. Most plants you can really categorize into three uh, different ways. You'll either have a high light plant, much like something that will be out in the desert or cacti and things like that. You'll have kind of a medium light plants, kind of like some shrubs and trees. And then you'll have low light plants, which are often what's used in homes and don't, can't handle a ton of light being put on them. So when you are in your house, the first thing you want to do is kind of look around and orient at your house or your apartment around the world. You know, where does it face? Here, my window faces north. And so if you do a little bit of research, you're going to know that especially in the summer and winter, the sun will often be a little bit more towards the south. And as it goes east to west, you're going to have a lot more sun exposure on your house. Whereas me here facing north, I've got another building on the other side. I barely get any light. So you want to know what way the, your windows face and how much light they're getting. And so as problems start to come up, really, sunburn is one of the easiest things to notice. And with that, you often see upright bleached and scorched leaves within them. And as, as you see in that picture, which will kind of clearly show that either it's a low light plant that's outside or you've positioned it a little bit incorrectly. So just move it away from the window, find a different window for it, find a different way to then go ahead and position that plant. So as we go forward, the next thing is watering. So if you've got the lighting correct and now watering is something you have to do constantly with your plants, what can often happen is that whether you underwater or overwater, that will pretty much equally kill your plant. And so what you want to do is, this is, I can't give you a specific recommendation because everything is going to vary, like your plant size, the type of the pot, the volume or container, what type of soil you have, and how much intensity of the light you have there. But for a rule of thumb, you want to make sure that whatever you're pouring or using in that area is draining and probably drying out by the next time. Let me go see, I think we've got a couple of questions. Put this up. Okay, so we can answer the non-technical name. Okay, let me minimize this. And so ways to start to look for this is too much water. Often, if your plant is getting way too much water, it will start to wilt in terms of it'll start to decay. And what's happening here is plants need oxygen, they need air, but not just on their stems, they also need it in their roots. So you want to pull back how much water you're putting or increase the frequency that you're doing it. And then not enough water. This can also be a relatively easy one to diagnose. Often as you grab the leaves, you'll feel them a little crimply. You'll see them start to fold as those cell walls within the each individual leaf empties out those cell walls collapse within the plant and is what causes a lot of that wilting. And of course, the soil is going to be very dusty and very crackly. And nutrients. So this is kind of not a controversial, but another difficult one to say. Most of the time, whenever you buy a pot from the nursery, it will come with these little beads in them. If you look closely, they'll either be green or white or yellow. Most of the time, that's some sort of slow release fertilizer in which it's a special coating that allows those nutrients to release over time. And plants really need three main nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium, NPK. And most fertilizers you buy are going to have a number like 10, 10, 10, 8 to 12 that are going to tell you the ratio. Uh, plants will normally need different ratios, but for the majority of houseplants, I recommend something with the same numbers all the way through, like 2, 2, 2, 4, 4, 4, for most of the time. 
spot, it's a lot easier to over fertilize and burn your plants than it is to under fertilize. If you under fertilize, the plant will start to grow a little bit slower. It might not develop as quickly, but if you over fertilize, you're going to burn the plant as you can see on this uh, slide right here. So you're often better doing a lot less, but follow the label. Every single fertilizer you buy will have some sort of label unless you're doing some sort of composting or kind of at home system in which we're not really getting into some of that right now, but it'll be a lot more technical. And, but most of the time those have less nutrients. And so pests. This is one of my favorite topics, but also one of the more complicated ones because prevention is key. Once you get a pest into your home or landscape, it's very difficult to treat it for most of the time. So you wanna make sure you're inspecting everything you bring into your home, everything you bring into your yard. But if you can't do that, you want to do what we call integrated pest management, which is a concept in which you're not just waiting for the pest to happen. You're constantly looking at your plants. You're constantly trying to be aware of what's going on. And so my big, easiest recommendation is that you can use neem oil, which is sold commercially, and a little bit of soap and detergent. You can mix those in small quantities with some water and put it in a spray bottle and that will often kill most insects that are on plants. Um, and you can look that information up. With that, sometimes that's not gonna be enough or it's gonna be very technical. I highly recommend you find your local plant diagnostic center that are kind of most of the times combined with your extension agencies and you can send out samples to them. And they'll often charge from anywhere between 30 and $40 but they'll give you an exact ID of that species, which is very necessary for you to be able to ID that. And insects are some of the coolest things I've worked with and kind of fought against, especially when I worked as a horticulturist and was doing a lot of organic type and very detailed work. And uh, if you see that picture right here at the bottom, let me go ahead and annotate these guys right here. It's this, black insect is a type of insect called an aphid that actually sucks sap from inside the plant to survive. But what's happened over time is that the ants know that as the aphids are sucking from the plant, they're excreting some type of honeydew, which they can eat. And the, far, the ants have learned to farm and protect the aphids. So they'll, they've developed these very mutualistic of uh, relationship, which I found fascinating, uh, which is why it's so important to really understand the insect, understand exactly who they are to be able to move forward. Okay, let's go to drawing. And so one of the new programs we are now kicking off is that your urban forestry division is going to try and provide an opinion or diagnostic for a lot of your local plants or your home plants. And so we want you to go ahead and email us at urbanforestry at miamibeachfl.gov. We do want to make sure to let you know that it is once again an opinion based on a photo. And oftentimes you do have to be on site. You've got to look at all the different factors, but we'll do our best to provide some sort of opinion. But you can also send samples to that local diagnostic clinic. And eventually you might have to go to a specialist for these things because you will need to have someone come to your home, uh, especially for landscape plants and be able to analyze everything thoroughly. And so just to quickly go over, make sure you're starting off with healthy material, you know how much you're watering your plant and that you're being aware of its individual requirements. Be gentle with the nutrients, be aware of pests, try not to bring them in their home and not every single plant is great for every single area. And now before we get into the question and answer, we are gonna have uh, some participant submissions. We've been asking all of you to go ahead and send us some photos. And as I pull this first one up, I'm gonna pull up the chat here to see. So what do you all think is happening with this plant? Let's see if we get anything from the chat. Any opinions? <laughs> yeah, it looks good. Oh, there we go. We got Jennifer Westholm. Maybe not enough drainage. Okay, overwatered. Okay, maybe it's too big for the container. So, a couple of people 
are seeing a couple of things. The plant for itself does look pretty good. You can see that it's got some nice growth. It's nice and green. Uh, right. Then the person that brought it in, though, is worried about this new sucker here, this new growth that is coming in very, very yellow, which one could be not enough light. But my biggest concern actually is if you bring your eyes down to here, see how you're almost starting to develop a, quite a bit of mold? This shows that water has been sitting in a spot whenever it's watered. And most likely this has no drainage down here. So whenever they pour the water in, it just sits there. So my first recommendation would be either one, get it in some sort of clay pot with drainage, kind of like one of the ones I have here with a little drainage hole and a type of uh, plate, or they can try to upcycle this kind of like I did here. Uh, this is actually one of these little vintage Coke bottles that what we did is we went ahead and drilled a hole in the bottom of it and paired that up with a plate and this is my one of my plant stands and i've paired that with soil and a little plant up here so with this improve the drainage see how that goes and if that doesn't help then maybe go ahead and try to find a higher light place clear all drawings and now we've got another one so this is more of an outdoor as you can see an outdoor tree and it's actually a really cool story because this tree was actually received by this homeowner in a tree giveaway done by the city uh, about one or two years ago. So we did the tree giveaway. They chose this gumbo limbo, the one we mentioned that was mentioned earlier by Tamara, and it was brought home. And so he was concerned that he had identified it as a type of white fly, the pest he was getting, but there are numerous species of white flies. A uh, little backstory here in Florida, a couple of years ago, we did have a lot of problems with a spiraling, spiraling whitefly that highly attacked a lot of our ficuses and the gumbo limbos. And the whitefly is a type of sap sucking insect. So they'll have this very tiny mouthpiece that those, you know, pierce through the layer of the tree and suck. And the problems that happen is, as we were talking about with the ants, as they start excreting this honeydew, that honeydew falls to the ground and most of the time creates some sort of uh, mold around it and it can stain everything. And really there are two courses for this tree. One, we can try and tackle the pest directly with a lot of methodology that we've done before. Or two, we can try and strengthen the tree by giving a little bit more fertilizer, making sure that it's in proper condition to try and give the tree its own ability to combat this pest. Since so trees can allocate a lot of their energy to, towards combating them because eradication isn't always the only choice. Sometimes in pest management, you do think about kind of just lowering the population of insects to a manageable degree so as your own tree can fight it. But what I would recommend is using, once again, that neem and soap solution, just regular dish soap, and just spraying that on the underside of the leaf and just manually cleaning those leaves. With the gumbo limbo, you could actually remove quite a bit of those leaves and it does have photosynthetic bark. So it could survive that. And that way you can kind of clear wherever the white flies are living and let it reflush out. But that's not always the options for every tree. Any questions about the gumbo limbo? Yeah. Perfect. So let's go ahead and we now have a video from the Maunui Botanical Garden Tour. <laughs> let me annotate, let me clear.
So it seems we may be having some issues with the video, so please stand by. Okay, can you guys hear it? it is a Polynesian no, we don't, we don't see the video or hear it, Flavia. Okay, let me try to share one more time. Sorry with the technology, guys. This is the first time we are sharing a video, so hopefully it will work. I'll try one more time now. Okay, can you guys see the screen now? Yeah, all right. Um, and before I do it, so I really wanted to give a, um, a big thank you to Tamara Cheryl from Maui Nui uh, Botanical Garden. She was very sweet to put together this video for us. Uh, and it's an amazing video uh, in their botanical garden in Maui. So start sharing now. My name is Tamara and you are at Maui Nui Botanical Gardens. Behind me, you can see Mauna Kahalawai, which is also known as the West Maui Mountains and the towns that are part of Mauna Kahalawai include Waikapu, Wailuku, Waihe'e, and Waihu. And if you hear the word Wai four times, that's because Wai means water in Hawaiian. And those four valleys and the rivers that fed all of that area were known as Nawaieha, or the four waters, which was the most productive taro growing or kalo in Hawaiian hollow growing area in all of Maui County. So I wanna wish all of you a happy Arbor Day in Hawaii. Um, Arbor Day is actually held in November and that's been a tradition since long before Hawaii was a state. Right behind me, you can see our state tree, which is Kukui, Aliretis Molokana. And it is a Polynesian introduced tree that is a beautiful tree that has dozens and dozens of cultural uses. Today, though, instead of talking about trees, I'm going to show you a little of the um, special native Hawaiian plants that we actually have to keep in planters because I know that you are learning today about um, how to tell if your potted plant is healthy and what to look for. So we're just going to visit a few of the really special plants that we keep in planters and talk about why we do that. This tree is at our front entrance and it is called thousands of pounds of fruit every year. The fruit is like a potato, crossed with artichoke, it's delicious, and then when it ripens up, it can become a really sweet, custardy kind of a food. So two foods on one tree, extremely productive, really easy to grow, and have a red fruit festival here every year. And if you look, here are some planters. These are kalo in planters. Kalo, or taro, Polycasia esculenta, was the single most important plant to pollinate with at least 300 unique Hawaiian varieties. And we grow them sometimes in planters, and we also grow them in the ground. We grow them in planters to keep our varieties separate. The one that you're seeing right now, the variety is called elapayo, and you see those beautiful speckles on the leaves are named after a native endemic forest bird called elapayo that has brown and white speckles on its breast. The Hawaiian method of cultivation of kalo was lo'i, which were constructed ponds with carefully managed flowing water. These like full sun, wet, they mature in about 9 to 11 months and they have to be harvested and replanted. So all parts are edible when cooked so you can harvest and eat them, but you do have to replant them. This is the Okay, guys, I apologize. We are being told that the video um, it's not uh, being transmitted correctly. So we are just going to, you know, be sharing it afterwards. Sorry about that. We are still trying to learn the technology. And Tamara, thank you so much. It was so amazing. I don't know if you want to um, say a few words, you know, you took so much time to, to go over the garden and talk about the plants there. Thank you. Thank no worries. You. No worries. no worries. Sorry about that. It's our, it's our first time too. So yeah, if you want to watch it, it's seven minutes long. It's not, it's not much longer. And um, there are some really special, we end with an endangered species that I think everyone will really like that I think is in cultivation in Florida. So thanks for giving us the chance to join in. Yeah, of course. 
Um, and I know that there are some more Q and A here. And and Carrie, I don't know if you have any any questions from from Sunrise that you would like to also throw at Harper. If so, do so. Um, and Harper, I don't know if you want to go over. It seems that we have some questions in the Q and A here before we move to Kahoot. Yes, so we can go ahead and use this time for questions and answers. Let me pull up the chat here. So we had one that was asked earlier. That's actually a very important one, which is should you put rocks at the bottom of a pot? It's often kind of used and talked about. I would recommend highly against it. Most of the literature does say that when you have a pot, especially one without a hole and you have the, just rocks under it, what happens is water will pool there and can actually kill the roots off by stopping them and suffocating them. What you're better off doing is to increasing the drainage overall in that media by adding some sort of extra filtration like adding a little bit of perlite or adding a little bit of sand. Um, and there's other types or even you have some of those uh, lava rocks that you can mix in with the soil to increase the overall drainage of that media within the pot. Let's see what else. Any other questions about the presentation? I know in the Q&A, so we've got one here, which is answer live, is what is the be best way to water orchids? So orchids are a little challenging. They can be a little more deceitful than some of the others since they are very, very sensitive. And so orchids aren't normally grown in pots, but because we're normally bring them inside or to very dry environments, what we have to do is help provide some of the moisture that would normally get in their normal and native areas, which is they're used to being in a hot and very, very humid area where they can get uh, water from their surroundings. So most of the time the potting media for orchids is something that will drain very quickly, isn't even compact at all, and you would put it in a pot, put it in kind of like a very, very quick drying media, and you will water it until it dries, let it dry out, and then water a little bit more. But one of the easiest ways to kill an orchid is to overwater it. And then what do you think about using terracotta plant nanny? So I don't know that what the plant nanny is. Plant nanny? One second. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back into this one. So the next one here is, yes, diatomaceous earth. So diatomaceous earth is actually a very, interesting uh, pest control. I've used it a lot in the past, especially actually inside of the home, because what it does is a very, very, very fine dust that gets whenever an arthropod, so anything like aphids, cockroaches, or even bed bugs, whenever they pass through it, they're covered in it and they don't have noses like we do to actually breathe through their exoskeleton. So they'll suffocate and just die from that. And so in landscaping, some people have used it within the pot to help suffocate some of those anthropods. Or if you know there's some sort of entryway, you can either pretty much just pour it on them. I've used it actually around my house on the borders. So in case there's any roaches or anything trying to get in, as soon as they pass through that, they are eventually killed. Okay, points two. How do, you use effect, how do you effectively transplant ferns that grow involuntarily outside your plant containers to a separate container for indoors? Okay, involuntarily. So oftentimes, whenever you're transplanting anything that has any sort of like aerial roots or very fine roots, you have to be very careful because not every plant can handle stress the same way. So the easiest answer would be just carefully make sure that as you're trying to peel that plant and those roots off, you're not damaging them. And you wanna make sure that when you're bringing them into that new pot, you're protecting as much as you can. And that's kind of the methodology across the board. Okay, one second. Uh, one second, how often? We've got another one. How often do we need to change the soil for my house plants? So this one will depend on how you're using the soil. So there's kind of two answers. The first one is if 
your plant stays in a pot and outgrows the pot, which then has roots starting to grow out of it or out of the top, you have either two things you have to do. You either have to step it up to a bigger pot and add more soil, or you have to root prune that plant. So you have to reduce the amount of roots and add more soil. If you have a plant that still hasn't outgrown the container, if you add fertilizers bit by bit, you won't ever need to change the substrate in it or soil unless you're trying to increase drainage or decrease drainage. Uh, what else? What got me into the plant world? Uh, that one is the scouting programs. Uh, I started going outdoors actually with my fifth grade field trip class. I went out to the Everglades <laughs> the first time. And I don't know if somebody else wants to go ahead and answer this one. Uh, some of the other panelists in terms of, I went out on a field trip on the Everglades. It was a three day overnight trip and I fell in love. <laughs> um, and actually originally went to college for music and ended up doing plants and the environment. Does anybody else want to answer this from the panelists? That's funny. Hey everybody, it's Carrie. I actually went to college for music too <laughs> uh, and ended up in this, but um, I, I went, I did a training with the National Wildlife Federation to become a habitat steward and that's where I fell in love with plants, more outdoor than indoor. Um, but uh, I'm learning about indoor plants um, and I had a couple of questions from the city of Sunrise Harbor if you wanted to take those. You want me to give you those live? So um, one came in from Joe um, and he maintains an area of outdoor plants, but he's asking um, if there's any recommendations for really low maintenance, like almost really hard to kill indoor plants um, that you could recommend. And then another question came in from someone um, asking about can herbs make good house plants? And if there's any tips or recommendations like edible herbs, like rosemary and thyme and things like that, or is there any trick to keeping those alive because they um, put them outside, but the insects and animals get to them before they can use them? Right. So I'll go ahead and answer yeah, both of them and I'll combine the second one with one that was asked here in the Q&A. So we've had to give kind of one house plant recommendation. Mine would be actually Sansevieria or snake plant, which I've got one right behind me. Multiple yeah, so I've got multiple, but here's a snake plant. There you go. Uh, this can be an invasive outdoors once again. It's also called as a woman's tongue or mother-in-law's tongue, <laughs> which is a weird name to it, but there's a lot of different cultivars. This is a very hardy plant. This one was collected from the wild. You can see there's a little bit of sunburn on it and brought indoors, but I've got multiples all around here and this will grow at a good rate. It's really difficult to kill. And once it outgrows the pot, you can actually divide it up or even make cuttings. So this is one that's very easy to propagate. And talking about herbs and gardens. So I'll combine those. So somebody just asked that they kind of planted a whole bunch of different seeds, followed all the instructions, and they never showed up of what oil, uh, soil level. Oftentimes what needs to happen for that process is called germination. Whenever a seed goes from being a seed and sprouts, germination often needs high heat and high light. So I would recommend for that person that tried that, maybe try an area with a lot more sunlight or get some sort of indoor plant to really try and target that. And then for bringing them indoors, I would make sure that it, they can be easily brought indoors. You just have to make sure that you're getting enough light it's either in a place that has a good window or you get a light. So like this one here is actually an indoor light and plants only use a specific type of the light spectrum, which is why they're green. <clears throat> so that green is, that color is the complete opposite of red on that color wheel. So that is a spectrum that plants absorb and absorb more readily. So you can have a plant like this one that's 100 watts. And even though it's 100 watts, it's giving out a lot more light for that power. Okay. About how to prevent twitches. Okay. Perfect. And then do we have any more questions? Okay. And then we have one for sunrise. How does sunrise prepare trees for hurricane season? I don't know if you guys want to go into that or. You mean like our, I didn't see that one that you mean for just it's our city? Q, it's on the Q and A, like on the Q and A side. Yeah. 
Well, we have our uh, landscaping group and crew and grounds crew uh, that go around before hurricane season um, and trim the trees on our city rights away, the, the trees that the city maintains. Um, and then we put out information for homeowners. Um, a good time to do that is right before and at the start of the hurricane season to do that before an actual hurricane comes. But you want to make sure you use a certified arborist and follow all the permitting and guidelines and reach out to the city's urban forester. Um, William Burns, he's not on this call with me, but he's there in our community development uh, department and he can help you through that process too. Yeah, and that's the biggest one. Uh, like Harry said, you do want to make sure you find a certified arborist to do the work and that just means that they have passed tests and have enough experience to really know how to work with trees. And oftentimes trees are better, it's better to not trim a tree than have someone trim it unprofessionally or to damage a tree because it's a lot harder to recover a tree than it is to damage it. Okay, so we have a actually a cool question. How mature should an avocado tree be before you consider grafting from a new, another fully matured avocado tree? So if you're all really interested in a lot of these topics, we can definitely do a follow-up on propagation and grafting. Uh, which really is how do you make babies from other plants and how do you actually combine one plant with another? So grafting is pretty much when you take like imagine you cut my arm off and you pasted it on Carrie and now Carrie has three arms and she can move that third arm. <laughs> That's essentially what trees can do. You can take a piece of one tree and put it on another one and it's gonna grow. It's done mostly with fruit trees because when you have fruit trees and let's say you have this one mango that's very juicy, you love the taste of it, you've got it just where you want, and now you want to have the same fruit. If you have babies, really it's not going to be the same because that baby of that mango is going to be 50% another tree and 50% that tree. So what you do is you take a cutting from that tree, you find another tree, oftentimes is a type of rootstock that's used, and you, pay, and you put it on it. So the simple answer is how much or should it be is one, do you like the fruit? And if you like the fruit and it's already fruiting, you can do it. And then if you're talking about the plant that's receiving the graft, that'll depend. So most of the time it'll have to be the same width. So you'll have to line up both of the same size to com combine them together. What else? And then any suggestions for edible plants other than herbs that can be grown indoors? I'm trying to think. Right now, I don't really have. Yeah, I think in, besides herbs, I've been looking into it. I know one of the hot, most highly recommended like balcony or slash indoor trees is citruses, uh, since those can be kept in smaller soil volume. Uh, so a citrus would be probably the my first recommendation. So we have a question from Sabrina. I have a lemon tree that gave me only one time lemons and now that is growing and has not given us any more. Uh, citruses are, especially for trees that aren't native to Florida, are very picky on um, their growing seasons. So I would try to find out what type of citrus you have and I would try to fertilize it and try to really increase or, you know, some sort of fertilizer on the, on the ground, but they also sell foliar sprays. So these are kind of short term fertilizers that you can apply to the leaves. Okay, well, how should we care for an old mango tree? Question from our Facebook viewers. Okay, so how should we care for an old mango tree that seems to be dying back? Trimming, fertilizers. There's kind of two things. So if it's an old mango tree, it could be going into what's called retrenchment, which is kind of when you think of a tree's life cycle. Retrenchment really is the end of that life cycle. And so if it's dying back, you, I would really recommend you bring in a certified arborist to assess it because oftentimes it will need to be structurally pruned to be reduced. And 
if you want to continue to get more yield out of it, you might want to continue fertilizer. So yes, to kind of both of those, I would recommend both of those, but they would have to be done correctly because if trimming and fertilizing is done incorrectly, it could actually kill the tree faster because you can shock the tree by removing too much and you could over fertilize it and burn it. Is lichen on trees an outdoor knockout rose bushes? Okay, so lichen is totally okay on trees. It's actually a symbiotic relationship that's developed on the bark of trees. Uh, so I wouldn't really worry about that. And Harper, I think we are uh, running out of time here. So I know that now Yoni takes over with our Kahoot. But thank you so much. We really appreciate the presentation and Tamara, you as well. And folks, if you guys have any more questions, please send out to us. So we'll make sure that, you know, we'll follow this up um, and uh, have them answered by our panelists. And again, we'll be sending out a survey afterwards. So please send your feedback, how we can improve, uh, what other workshops can we provide to you? Yeni, all yours. And we can definitely move on to some of these more advanced topics. Today, we really covered a lot of these basics. And so if you all want to learn a lot more about grafting, about propagation, and more in-depth into plants, you know, let us know in that survey. And we can definitely put together more of these series starting to go a little more in-depth. Thank you all. Thanks, Harper. OK, I hope you guys are all paying attention as we're reaching the you know, the end of the, the workshop. Um, so we're going to quiz you on everything that you learned. So make sure that you all have your phones out. Um, we're going to play a little game of Kahoot and I'll lay out the rules for you in the following page. Give me one second and we'll get started. Do you all see my screen? Yes, yes? we do. Okay, awesome. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to the website kahoot.it and you're going to put in this pin that you see here at the top. So once you put in the pin, make sure you put in your nickname so we can get started. And so I'll give everyone about a minute to join. I know we have a lot of people on the, on the chat, well, in the, in the workshop. And come on guys, join in because you get prizes. Yeah, so one thing I forgot to mention is that you do get prizes if you um, reach the top three. And so you don't only get points from getting the question right, but also how fast you answer. False. It is Arbor Day in Hawaii today. I know that Tamara mentioned um, that Arbor Day is actually in November, correct? For Hawaii? Good job, Carrie. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. So we have Tree Lover at the top. And one thing I want to mention is that if you are in the top three, um, we'll put my email into the chat box so you guys can reach out to me um, and we'll touch base about your prize. The top five requirements for plants to grow include the following. <laughs> Awesome. 
we got it right. I'm not sure who put water because I'm pretty sure most plants do need water. So we'll move on to the next question. Tree lover is still at the top. So true or false, the gumbo limbo is an invasive species in Hawaii. <laughs> everyone. Okay, next question. Tree lover. Uh, all right. There are many benefits to trees, including Tree lover is still in the lead. Last question. What is most likely wrong with your plant if its leaves start to wilt? <laughs> That was the correct answer. All right, so let's see who's in the top three. My email's in the chat if you guys um, won. Hold on, I think I put it in the wrong place. I'll resend it. All right, so the winners are. Awesome guys, thanks so much. Yeni, I don't know if you wanna share it back to the last slide. Um, and also guys, um, I, you know, we, we, I didn't have the opportunity to introduce, but actually we have Elizabeth Wheaton, our environment and sustainability director that joined us here today as well. So just, thanks Flavia. This was such an awesome workshop today. Thank you everyone who put time and sweat into making this a reality, so. Uh, thanks for all the panelists and also thanks for all the attendees. Thanks for joining us and uh, we really appreciate uh, your time and look forward to hosting uh, some more of these. Awesome. Thanks, Patsy. And I also wanted to, to thank, you know, Harper, Omar, Tamara, our panelists today, and also all the cities that join us. Thank you so much, Penny, Jennifer, Makalea, Carrie for joining us. Um, and all the municipalities and counties that join. Uh, stay tuned, Monday we have another Sustainachella coming up. Uh, we are going to talk about plastic pollution and reduction, so a lot of plastics. Um, and several cities are joining us again, and this time they actually are going to be talking about what they're doing in regard to plastic in their cities and county as well. So we look forward to, to have you joining us on Monday. And, you know, just ending up with a lot of love and gratitude, sending much love to, the, to everyone and, and, and gratitude for you guys to, to join us today. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice evening. Aloha. Aloha. Bye.